Okay, so today we are going to um, talk about uh, model-based design. One of the main idea in this textbook, uh, or the you know, as the uh, main content in this course, is that um, we're going to be not only talking about how we program microcontrollers, um, how we design these systems. We can also look at uh, in terms of well, before you actually do the design, uh, what are the things you should consider um, when you start with the design. So we will look a lot into the model-based methods. So design you're going to be end up with start with some models. So today we're going to talk about uh, the concept of model and how that uh, influence the design process. So we're gonna talk about model-based de design and we're gonna talk about a uh, cyber physical system example. And I will later introduce the Arduino de de development flow. And if I have time, I will um, briefly introduce the first lab. So last week we talked about this modeling, design, and analysis. Uh, as we show in this diagram, uh, these three parts or three stages form a uh, iterative process. Modeling is the process of gaining a deeper understanding of the system through imitation. So when we are given a problem or a, a implementation or solution to design, uh, we are faced uh, with some uh, actual um, applications and these applications uh, have different requirements uh, in terms of the functionality, uh, the uh, performance metrics. Uh, modeling is, uh, you know, in this context is try to understand uh, the cyber physical system that we are trying to, to design for, to build. Um, this cyber physical system will interact with the physical um, part of it uh, using sensors and actuators. Um, also, uh, we will um, use the, the cyber portion of it uh, to control or sense the physical environment or physical um, um, you know devices. So we want to have we want to have a, first a model that can specify what a system does. Um, so what will be the you know the LEDs that you want to use to show different colors? How many colors you're going to show, for example? Uh, or if it is a motor, uh, you know what kind of you know, motor you're dealing with. Is it a DC motor or is it a, a step motor? Um, so what, what kind of movement you want to generate when you have this cyber physical system? Um, then the design part is uh, what we traditionally focus on, which is the structured creation of artifacts. This includes hardware and software. So at this step, you go ahead, pick, you know, uh, individual components, uh, hardware components, how to connect them uh, using what kind of buses, and then write software that will run on such hardware systems. Um, so this is where we um, spend a lot of time, um, you know, thinking about how we built such a system and how we you know, debug the design so it can work uh, to produce the expected results. This stage also includes optimization. You may end up having uh, to change uh, the processor or the memory component or the uh, IO devices to make it, you know, more, um, you know, faster or more energy efficient. Uh, so that's, you know, the optimization is part of the design stage. And the third stage is the analysis stage. Analysis is the process of gaining a deeper understanding of the system you build. And it requires uh, sometimes the section 
uh, which means that you're going to be using tools, maybe hardware probes or um, software, uh, you know, debug um, um, or software uh, performance analysis tools to understand the performance of each of these uh, components that in your system. Uh, with a good understanding, a deeper understanding of how system behaves, uh, you can um, you know, figure out whether the design meets the requirement. And if it does not, uh, hopefully the analysis will help you to understand why a system uh, does not um, do well it's supposed to do. And these three things are often the time, you know, interact. So it may not necessarily go from modeling design analysis and, you know, without any uh, look back uh, or uh, change of the course, you may end up having to go back from the design phase to the modeling phase to, you know, if you face uh, unsolvable issues, and then you may think about whether the modeling part can be tweaked a little bit uh, to make the design process easier uh, or the, the cost is cheaper. So that's also a possibility. And for analysis is of, often very important at every step. Um, you may need to have these quantitative measurements so that the uh, modeling and design can be uh, well informed and, and guided. So as a start, uh, we will start with models. And models can be represented using many different formats. Um, oftentimes you want to draw a schematic or um, you know, some, um, not necessarily the circuit schematic, but some kind of abstractions that will capture the main um, you know, physics process um, or uh, elements uh, the, or the interaction between the machine and the human. So all these parts uh, can be uh, or should be um, captured uh, as uh, part of the models. Um, the models will define what are the input signals, uh, what will be the frequency of input signals, and how many sensors there will be, um, these sensors, what will be uh, their um, what will be the um, metrics or the uh, physical um, um, uh, physics um, properties that they will measure. And in terms of the controlling these um, physical processes or machines, what will be the actuators that you have to have in this system? And in between, you will of course have your computational components maybe a networking of components to connect uh, these uh, different elements. Um, in the first example, as you can see here, this is a uh, kind of signal processing, um, pro uh, signal generation and processing model. Uh, what will be the uh, input signal? Uh, where we'll apply filters? Uh, you know, how we control the power output? Uh, how we output the power uh, spectrum, etc. Uh, so these are, you know, um, some examples um, that show that we um, um, we should you know, get a good understanding of the um, cyber physics system that we want to build, and uh, start with this kind of abstractions. The abstractions will give you a lot of information about, you know, when you get to the design stage, uh, what are the components you have to use. Uh, is it going to be a micro, a very low end microcontroller, or do you have to have a microprocessor that is able to run the operating system? So that will, um, these kind of selections in the design phase will be heavily influenced by the models that you are uh, working with. Um, so I don't know if you can hear the ticking. Uh, this is a uh, called a Newton Cradle. Um, some of you may own it or may play with it. Um, so this is a, a physics um, process. Uh, the, this process is the, in this example, is the target 
uh, being modeled. And to model this, you can have many methods, but Newton has this uh, uh, Newton's law, I think this third law of motion. Um, some of you, including me, we learned this in, in uh, uh, college early years, but uh, this really shows uh, how people have been using models to provide an abstraction of the reality here. Uh, this model captures the, uh, the motion, the speed, and how uh, it's going to be uh, changing based on the time, uh, depending on the time. Um, and this, uh, you know, differential equations uh, is a is calculus and uh, it's part of the Newton's laws. Um, you know, the 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 goal here for this example is, of course, uh, we want to use uh, such mathematical models to um, capture this uh, physics process. And fidelity is how well the model and its target match. Uh, so if there's no uh, energy loss in any form, uh, this process can go on forever. But in reality, this will eventually stop because there's, you know, uh, the friction of the air or uh, these coming from the wires. So a lot of things may happen. So eventually this process will, will slow down. Uh, but still this model uh, in mathematical format captures the uh, basic principles um, in this physics process. Um, this uh, slide I just want to, you know, say that the model and target, um, it, of course, they're different. Um, so some people will say that, you know, why do we have to have a model? Uh, because this famous person said, um, you know, Solomon Golom, he said, you n never strike oil by drilling through the map which is true, right? Uh, it, you, you won't get the reality that the oil coming underneath the map, but uh, nevertheless, we should start with a map because um, you, you can't, you know, you can't really do a lot of uh, discovery drilling without a map. So map in this example is a very good abstraction of the geography uh, um, structure of the earth. Um, the locations, orientations. Uh, so, you know, as a good engineer, you should start with the map if you want to find the, the oil well and start drilling. Um, so, what we learn from here is that uh, you should not uh, confuse model with target. Uh, we should have models uh, for uh, the cyber physical system target that we're trying to design. Okay, next concept is the deterministic. Uh, deterministic um, really means that uh, the um, model or properties are deterministic. Uh, the most valuable models, uh, some of the most valuable models are deterministic. Uh, model is de deterministic if given the initial state and the inputs and that the model defines exactly one behavior. Um, you can find that this is generally true for many situations, uh, especially for the system you're trying to design, most cases. And that's uh, the ideal case we want to achieve. Um, and in such, in many of these applications, if you have a deterministic model, uh, the de design will be easier, especially if you want to bound any conditional um, you know, uh, situations, condition boundaries, uh, deterministic model will uh, be um, very helpful. And of course, on the other hand, non-deterministic model uh, may happen and they have their own property and they will cause some challenges uh, in the design process.
So let's look at this simple cyber physical system. Um, we are designing this cyber physical system, which is to um, sense the environment in a physical plant and then use some sort of actuators, maybe motors, uh, to change the you know, manufacturing process or any uh, things that this physical plant requires. So if you look at these arrows uh, showing here, uh, so coming from the physical plant, uh, this arrow pointing to the computational platform, you can think about this is some kind of sensor inputs. Uh, the sensors will be collecting information and send the information to uh, this computational platform could be a microcontroller based uh, embedded system there. And then um, there could be multiple computational platforms. One is doing the sensing, the other one is doing the uh, actuation control. And these two parts uh, may not reside physically uh, next to each other. So they could be uh, separated in different regions, uh, different rooms uh, in this physical plant. So we need some sort of network fabric, uh, which we'll talk about uh, different networking technologies we can use to connect these computational platforms. So you can see here, we have a very um, complete um, you know, control loop. So we have sensing, uh, we have uh, some computation and then sending the control signal to another computation platform and eventually generate the control signals for the actuators. Um, ideally, everything is perfect. So the computational um, uh, task is uh, deterministic. And also for the um, communication part, for the networking, there'll be no delays. Um, but in reality, um, there are a lot of things could go wrong. For example, the physical noises could uh, cause the sensors to malfunction or um, send inaccurate readings. And the network fabric may uh, cause packet losses uh, due to the unreliable media, uh, for example, Wi-Fi. Uh, and also through the network fabric, there could be uh, unknowable and non-deterministic delays in the computational platforms, uh, depend on you know, what kind of processors you use, whether you run the operating systems or not, uh, you may have uncontrollable scheduling delays uh, if you have multiple tasks running on the same platform. As a result, the execution time of these uh, tasks on the platform will be uh, unknown or non-deterministic. And for the final control, there could be imperfect actuations of those machines. So we can see from this diagram that the deterministic model uh, may not capture exactly what will happen in the uh, real world. There are a lot of the things can go non-deterministic. But with that said, uh, we still have to uh, have a deterministic model as a start to capture the essence of this system. And without that, uh, you will be you know, shooting you know, um, a random target. So we saw earlier that example, there um, could be many non-deterministic, unreliable, unknowable uh, factors, uh, delays uh, in real world. So what we're saying now here is that a model need not be true uh, to be useful. So a deterministic model um, is a good start, uh, but it may not capture 100% of the real uh, system's behavior. So it, this uh, quote uh, is very uh, interesting in my opinion. So all models are wrong, but they are useful. So even the Newton's law, the third motion's law, um, it's, you know, mathematically it's uh, very 
you know, beautiful mathematical equation. But in reality, the physics system uh, may not be uh, 100% follow that. Uh, um, um, what, what, I, what, I'm, what I mean is that uh, the, uh, the mathematical equation captures the essence, essence of the physical processes, but any real processes may involve uh, additional factors that are not reflected uh, in that mathematical equation. But still, uh, that equation is very useful. So the, um, what, what kind of models should we use? Uh, let's look at some um, successful models from the cyber and the physical world. Software uh, is a model. Um, the, the reason we say that is software is um, a good abstraction of what your computational systems can do. If you have a physical system, um, you know, based on any kind of processors or microcontrollers, uh, plus its peripheral components, um, you will need to write code that will run on top of this physical system or this physical processor. Um, so what you see here on the right side is the uh, model uh, in the format of uh, a few lines of code. Um, of course, you, you have to map this uh, onto this physical system uh, using software tools, compilers, and loaders, etc. But what this can allow uh, people to do is uh, we will have a um, way to provide an abstraction of the processor uh, so that the programmers, the developers of the software, like you guys, you don't really have to you know, personally build this uh, computing system, uh, this, this circuit board or even the processor. You can just follow this um, high level language syntax. Uh, this could be, uh, I think like a Java code. And this Java code will be able uh, to execute this algorithm uh, on this processor. And um, when you write the software, uh, there are a lot of things you should consider. One of them is, uh, is there a single-threaded um, program or a multi-threaded or parallel program? If it's a single-threaded program, uh, like uh, we showed here in this example, and chances are this kind of programs are uh, deterministic models. Because when you uh, execute uh, this program uh, from its entry point, from the first line in this program, the execution will follow precisely the, the logic that you implement using this high level language. Uh, you have a for loop, uh, and then you have some, um, you know, if statements uh, and another if statement, then uh, a nested for loop with if statements. These um, syntax, these um, lines will be followed exactly uh, at runtime based on the, of course, the, the values of these um, variables. Um, you don't expect that this program will go, will produce you non-deterministic output as long as your input is deterministic. The reason we emphasize the single thread uh, because uh, when you have a single thread program, you, you don't have any um, variables that will be affected by other uh, running instances, like another thread or another, or another processes. Um, when you have multi-threaded programs or parallel programs, and when you share variables, and that's a different story. And that's where the non-deterministic or non-deterministism will uh, come in because um, each run of the same program may uh, lead to a um, different um, timing related sequence of these variables. Uh, the values will change depending on the time. Uh, so your execution flow will be affected. If you have a single threaded program, 
then you can confidently say that uh, the execution path will be deterministic. So that's what I want to say about this software uh, as a model. Uh, it's a very interesting concept. I think uh, uh, you should um, you know, understand um, this is uh, what you can view and uh, when you um, pursue any um, cyber, system, cyber physical system designs. Um, this you know, shows a little bit more about what I just said, the single thread program. Um, this program defines exactly one behavior uh, given the input X. Uh, so based on the value of the X, uh, if it is greater than 1,000, you'll become a 1,000. Uh, if it is a uh, you know, um, positive number, uh, it will um, you know, uh, go into this uh, if statement, otherwise it will stop. Um, so this uh, example is a C language implementation. Uh, this um, software model or this language defines the, the behavior uh, and also the input. When we have this deterministic program, uh, single-threaded, uh, the target of the model is actually non-deterministic. Um, how we understand is that, you know, um, because in the physical process, uh, when, um, when you apply current to this um, computer board uh, with this processor, the electrons uh, and, you know, running through the silicons uh, their behaviors are non-deterministic. That this is at the very you know lowest level uh, of the hardware uh, that we we are observing here. Um, and then you may ask, oh, so in, if that's the case, how do I guarantee that my program will be executing and producing the uh, expected behavior, the expected outcome? Um, it is because we have uh, s several other layers of abstractions of this hardware uh, on top of this electrons. Um, you don't expect that uh, this uh, you know, C program to map to these electrons directly. Uh, you actually have a lot of uh, intermediate layers or abstractions. For example, instruction set, uh, and then this um, um, architecture of the processor, uh, the pipelining and the microarchitectures, uh, all these uh, internals uh, designs of this processor. Um, this is where I was, you know, um, talking about um, the um, another um, layer of deterministic model that abstracts the hardware. So, given the physical system. Although uh, it is true that the electrons move around uh, non-deterministically uh, at the um, you know, atomic level, but uh, on top of that, we have several layers of abstraction. And this is the um, model uh, at the um, uh, instruction layer. This is the instruction set architectures or ISAs. ISAs are um, um, abstractions of microprocessors or microcontrollers. Every processor, as long as it's programmable, uh, it defines a um, certain type of instruction set. Uh, there are several main, you know, two main um, instruction set. Um, do you guys know? two main categories. R-A-S-K. R-A-S-K. Uh, R-I-S-C, my bad. That's right. Uh, so uh, you're right, that's one of them. Uh, that's shown here. Um, there's another type, it's kind of the opposite to, to the risk. Complex. C-I-S-C? Yes, so CISC, so complex interesting set. Um, very good. Uh, so can you tell me uh, a 
example of risk um, based processor arm good what about cisc based processor x86 that's right so x86 um so those two are i would say probably the most popular um two instruction set uh, for you know majority of the processors um so in this example uh it's a risk based in instruction set um the reason we call it risk is because every instruction has the same 32 bit length in as shown here and um on the higher um, bits, it defines the locations of the registers. So you have five bit um, you know, value to define the destination um, register and then two other source registers in the register file. And the lower bits defines the actual functionality of the, uh, the instruction, uh, start with the upper code, and then follow the upper code, we have a 10 bit uh, function field, uh, selects the type of operand operations. Um, so this is the risk instruction set. Uh, so this is the abstraction of the processor. Uh, what this tells you is that as long as you generate uh, sequences of such instructions, your program will be able to execute on this particular processor um, as defined by these instructions. On the other hand, if it is a CISC um, type of uh, in a processor, then the instructions will be uh, different uh, from instruction to instruction. The length of the instruction will depend on the um, type of the instruction, the number of operands and type of operands. But um, you know, either one, uh, either CISC or RISC, uh, the instruction set architecture are deterministic models. And that's why uh, for software, you can rely on uh, such um, deterministic model, uh, no matter how the electrons move, uh, these uh, functionalities will be uh, supported. The instruction set architecture relies on uh, another deterministic model. And this model is basically the circle uh, level model. So we have uh, a NOT gate and, and NAND gate uh, inverters uh, you have, uh, this is the multiplexer, uh, you have an uh, AND gate, NAND gate, and you have adders. Uh, these type of um, um, models or schematic uh, is also deterministic. This is the uh, digital logic level, uh, which is going to be implemented uh, at the end on top of this uh, silicon wafer, uh, wafer uh, within the chips. And because this synchronous digital logic is deterministic, uh, that's how we can guarantee the instruction set uh, can be supported uh, in a deterministic way. Okay, so we know cyber physical system has both the cyber side and also the physical side. Uh, the physical side is often um, you know, involves certain physics uh, dynamics, um, sensing um, or uh, actuation. Um, so any physical system that we interact with follows some kind of physics law. Um, so uh, in this regard, what we can also do is to model such physical processes. And we can model um, this, um, you know, uh, machine using uh, signals going into the machine and signals coming out of the machine. And uh, oftentimes these models are, you know, continuous models um, uh, because the physical process is continuous. Um, so you see a lot of differential equations if you uh, model this physical process. And such differential equations uh, are deterministic models because given the input uh, you expect to have a deterministic output. Okay, um, so we heard some good news. Uh, a lot of models are deterministic uh, from the physics side, from the cyber side. On the cyber side, even though 
uh, the electrons movement uh, uh, is not deterministic, but the um, digital logic, the instruction set, the software are all deterministic. But even these several layers are deterministic, but when you combine them, uh, you have uh, now a major problem. What we mean by that is when you have these uh, physical processors, when you have software and you have your physics process and, and you have your uh, differential equation models to model such physical pr process. So all these components, these um, parts are deterministic, but when you combine them, uh, things are getting um, murky. Um, things may become non-deterministic. Um, we'll, we'll see why that's the case, uh, but the idea is uh, you, you're gonna face a lot of different layers and also uh, these um, different system, you know, they all happen at the same time. So timing, uh, well time makes this uh, um, combination suddenly a very complex uh, non-deterministic process. Okay, so you know that modern airplanes, um, you, you have you know, one pilot or several pilots that control the airplane, uh, but the airplane, in the early days, uh, you, if you saw those um, movies of, you know, um, war, war um, movies, those old machines, um, twin engine um, airplanes, they control, um, they are controlled by the pilot using mechanic or hydraulic controllers. Um, in the modern airplanes are uh, now, of course, different. Uh, they use computers to control the airplane. So any instructions from the pilot uh, through you know, flip the switches or turn the knobs will be sent to the uh, main controller of the aircraft. Uh, the main controller of the aircraft will get these control signals and then um, change those control signals to actual um, movement um, commands to these mechanics, uh, mechanical or hydraulic uh, machines. For example, you know, um, change the, um, you know, uh, um, the um, change the engine speed uh, or the, um, the wing um, angle, um, etc. And the fly-by-wire concept uh, enables that uh, computers can be used to uh, perform additional checks on these commands from the pilots. So it's kind of medi uh, mediating pilot commands to double check if these commands are valid or safe to apply. Um, you know, if these commands violate some you know, um, safety uh, measures. So when you design such a complex cyber physical system where you want to have the, this plane aircraft flying safely from uh, your um, takeoff place to the destination uh, and you want to, to be able to um, still let the pilot manipulate the aircraft uh, and then you know, uh, perform um, flight that's uh, fuel efficient uh, on time. Uh, so all these tasks, um, you know, uh, all these requirements uh, will make this uh, cyber physical system a very um, complex um, and challenging uh, system to design. What we show here on the left side is not necessarily the systems in this airplane, uh, but what we just want to show that the, um, there are different layers of abstractions uh, from the system point of view, you um, start from the uh, bottom, the physical layer, you have chips. Uh, These chips could be uh, FPGAs or microprocessors. Uh, and then uh, you may have um, a, another layer of uh, abstraction. Uh, or actually, let, let, me, let me start from the top to down. So you start with some kind of performance models 
uh, and you design uh, hardware distribution languages, BHDL or Redlock uh, programs, and that maps to FPGA configurations and eventually to FPGA chips. Uh, if you design pure software, uh, you may start with algorithms and implement that using C or C++. And uh, then uh, that will be uh, mapped to uh, some kind of, um, you know, x86 um, uh, instruction binary, the um, assembly language instructions, and eventually to um, its binary format and execute it on the microprocessor. So you, you have very um, you know, structured layered um, you know, design in this process. And of course, that's the ideal case and we want to use to hide the detailed implementation uh, below that the layer. And so you know, the designers can uh, have a, uh, a simpler um, um, abstraction layer to work with. Well, it's not as um, that clean uh, layer structure for designing a aircraft. Uh, the abstract layer is not uh, as well defined uh, as you have, a, you know, a simple computer system that does one thing. Um, so the the collapse of this abstract layers make the design uh, much more complex and, and costly, and uh, the design. Uh, is actually is the implementation if you don't have a good abstraction. So you, you basically you start from scratch. You it's like you 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 went back. You go back to the days that you want the pilot to um, control the airplane using mechanics uh, levers and uh, hydraulic uh, you know um, steering wheels like that. Um, so that's really not what we um, would like to have. Um, so we ne really need to raise uh, the level of abstractions. Um, you know, you, you, it depends on the actual problem. You may have to start with much higher abstraction, uh, not necessarily you know, following exact these layers in this diagram, uh, but you, uh, you need to have um, something you can start with to, um, to capture the essence of the uh, cyber physical system uh, for example, if there's aircraft, uh, you want to set certain uh, minimal speed uh, if the uh, uh, aircraft is airborne. Uh, also, you want to set a, you know, the um, minimal um, altitude uh, for the um, airplane to be safely, um, you know, moving. So those are something that you need to start with. Uh, and you should not just go directly implementing this C or C++ code uh, to control certain actuators. Well, that's where we want to head into. Um, so we want to have higher abstraction uh, so that we can um, start um, um, so, so we can start uh, with a uh, with a with an abstraction layer that captures the um, essential requirement. So that's the model we're talking about. But when you go higher abstraction layer, you also have the risk of you know missing out on the um, low level, lower level um, implementations. Uh, the example we have here is that um, um, the um, worst case execution time. So WCET here refers to worst case execution time. Um, this um, um, war story, you know, shows that the um, because the um, the Ebonics, uh code from Airbus running on this Motorola, Motorola processor. Code fire 5307. Uh, this processor has a pipeline CPU. Um, pipeline means that you, when you have an instruction, uh, you execute the instruction uh, in terms of stages. Uh, the simplest pipeline could be instruction fetch, 
uh, instruction execution, uh, instruction uh, commit. So the, the actual processor will have uh, more stages than the example I, have, I gave here. But the concept of this pipeline is to um, basically um, take advantage of the resources on the chip so that you can have uh, more than one instruction executing at the same time at different stages. Uh, this will greatly improve the CPU's uh, performance. Um, also, in the processor, especially modern processors, there are data caches. Uh, so data caches are uh, on-chip memories that you can uh, store data uh, temporarily. Uh, but you know, it, it, this caching of data is transparent to the developers, uh, which means that you don't really program your code to have caches uh, storing those frequently used data. Caches are built into these processors. So these pipeline design of the data path and the uh, usage of data cache, this on-chip fast memory, will uh, affect the execution time of these individual instructions. So if you say, okay, I execute my 100 instructions uh, the execution time is, let's say, uh, 100 you know, millisecond. Uh, then you take this as your um, um, performance numbers and, you know, think that every instruction, um, you know, every instruction does the same thing. Um, and that's, the, you know, universal for every single instruction. Such uh, assumption uh, is dangerous uh, because um, it depends on where the data resides. Uh, if you, the data are already cached uh, in the chip, in this on-chip cache, and of course you can have a faster execution time. But if the data uh, are mostly off-chip, then you have to load data from the memory off-chip onto this processor to, for computation uh, in that case, the execution time is actually much um, lot longer than uh, what we saw earlier. So um, this uh, will affect uh, the worst case execution time that people uh, can assume of. And if your design uh, is uh, strictly re um, um, timing or required strict timing uh, like this, uh, Evonics code for airplanes, then this is something you should be very, very careful about. Uh, do not make such assumptions to say um, the execution time is guaranteed to be a certain number um, because each processor may have different data paths and the size of uh, the cache would be different. So that will affect the execution time. 